which I will not name. It was a living, open-ended uh, uh, framework for discussion. Okay, that's Jim. Now here's that cunning-looking fellow you saw at the back of the Bloomington picture. That's how he looked uh, in 62, 61. That's Paul Booth, who's the assistant to the president of AFSME, and, and running their operations, hopefully for better, not for worse, in Wisconsin at this moment, from his perch uh, uh, at the seat of power of the AFL-CIO back in Washington, D.C. And he watches Wisconsin on a 24-hour basis because it's his money going out the door. It's his union's prestige that's on the line. Uh, he knows, because I've talked to him, that the unions were drawn into this by the young people, just as we drew the UAW long ago into our movement. And he doesn't know what the outcome will be, but his, his faith in social movements and the potentials of people has been very much renewed, but he is a definite definite outcome of poor Jiren 50 years later, not much different. He's the one, by the way, that the left of SDS separated from saying he was too reformist. This was in 1965 when he proposed an alternative to the, the, the draft that you could go into national or international service, build not burn. That was considered uh, uh, some, some kind of selling out and so he went off uh, and, and some would say he followed his destiny all the way to the present moment where he is an instigator, organizer, administrator in uh, uh, one of the most powerful of uh, the unions, one that was actually created here in the state of Wisconsin. That's uh, Paul. He's deceased. Some of us died young. Uh, he gave a, a seminal speech in uh, 65 and now I'm going to transition into what, 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 what else I want to talk about. I, I can't emphasize enough that this was about the early moment. Civilizations passed through stages, so did SDS. And the stages can be very rapid. A whole era can be done in three years. And there was at least the era of early idealism, direct action, voter registration, the awakening on the campuses, through the free speech movement. Um, then, uh, much to our shock, the president who promised not to send troops to Vietnam did so. Then came a new phase of SDS, the beginning of resistance and opposition, which Paul articulated in a way that would make your great historian, William Appleman Williams, very, very proud. We relied on Appleman Williams very much uh, what Paul said was, uh, Vietnam is the, 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 the cutting razor that is revealing to us the true nature of our system uh, for all of us to see and to analyze and to find a way to change. It is preventing us from our dream of organizing in the slums and ghettos and barrios and fields of America for an interracial movement of poor people a revitalization of unions, an awakening of young people, and instead is sending all of us off to war or into uh, a, a choice no, no one should impose on anyone else, which is uh, go to Vietnam to die or survive or go to Canada or go to jail. So this was a, an epical speech that is still uh, repeated, and his, um, his leadership uh, was lost rather, <clears throat> rather uh, soon, and, and it exists only in recordings, and this is a speech that I think was probably the best, most eloquent thing written after Port Huron that uh, ought to be included <clears throat> as you examine some of the lasting documents. That was Paul. <laughs> no, Al Camus from CUNY, he was a... <laughs> <laughs> you, won't, you won't see Karl Marx here. This, this is the beginning of, of revelation of who the spiritual and intellectual godfathers were. Above all, Camus. 
Why? Uh, I think it was because if you read the plague, it said, it's all hopeless. The only thing you can do in a situation of hopelessness is form units to go out to try to save people's lives, save their health from the plague. That's the moral act in action. That's what it meant. And that's what SNCC meant. That's what the community organizing projects meant. We did not have optimism or pessimism. We saw the plague. And, and as organizers, we took the approach that one would today describe as a public health approach. Not knowing where we were going, what was the long-term ideology, but you either remained oblivious or you had to give yourself over to the trials and tribulations of people who were suffering and work with them to empower them. That was what Camus gave to us. That's why he's, he's there. Mills. Mills, he didn't make it to Port Huron. He died in 62. Um, I think so did Camus. Um, is that right, Paul, or 61? 60. Camus died. Camus died in 60. They got us to the 60s. Um, the, the, the importance of uh, Mills was that he was a, a reader's guide to what we were experiencing. In Mississippi, we wanted to know who's calling the shots here, who's behind the sheriffs, who's behind the sheets. And it would turn out to be white citizens councils, but they were allied to agricultural corporations, and they were tied into public and private utilities and uh, chain stores that went north, and they had owners, and they had boards of directors and managers, and they were uh, revealed to us by research, our own research, power structure research, based on C. Wright Mill's writing about elites and how there's a power elite uh, that is loosely organized but surpasses democracy. And his writings on the white collar uh, society and mass society and and uh, especially his writings about the, uh, the power elite had an enormous effect on the writing of the Port Huron Statement. I have no doubt that he, he, even in death, he drafted parts of it. Because we were not plagiarizing, and I don't know where some of that language came from. Dewey. Some of us could talk all night about Dewey, but just a word about Dewey. Dewey Gave, Dewey was, the, I think, the chairman of the LID in the 20s or 30s. None of us knew him. But he left behind these books, for those of you that like to leave behind books. Uh, there's a value to that. They're like uh, notes in a bottle floating down through the river of time. And he left the idea that democracy had to be more than the vote. This was not a new idea. Thoreau had had the idea. Many had had the idea. But he, he, he said... Democracy has to be widened, it has to be deepened. We have families that are autocratic and patriarchal where there's no equality in the family and that's where a kid learns to be submissive. Women learn to be the, the second class. He said the workplace is completely oligarchical. The, the workers' energy, input, creativity is shunned aside. Uh, they're treated as units of production. He said neighborhoods, uh, are alive with vital energy that needs to be recognized in the process. So he gave us the idea that a democracy should be measured by how much participation occurs and how widely the particip participation occurs. And just before Port Huron, our philosophy professor, um, Arnold Kaufman, told us that what we were talking about was participatory democracy and he described it that way as an attempt to base democracy on the moral principle of trying to fulfill as much as possible all the creative potential of human beings. And he got the idea from John Dewey, he said. This, uh, somebody throw me a bottle of water. This, this is a, um, an oddity. I have a crazy friend, uh, Eamon, who's trying to uh, do a documentary.
documentary about participatory democracy. He's a great filmmaker. He usually does music videos, but he's 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 sort of flipped out and become a painter. So so he painted us this poster. This poster. There's a misspelling in it. You get a prize if you can discover it. But uh, it, 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 it's it's been used in many classes and conferences this year. That's all it is. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm fine. I'm fine. Oh, this is my class at UCLA winter quarter. This is about three months ago. What the students did was they took the, took the statement, broke it down, sat in groups, uh, and rewrote it in terms of their generation's needs. Went through the whole. Uh, mad process of trying to collectively write something, agree on it, present it to the class, present it to the professors, and then the culmination of that all-day, all-campus conference on reimagining Port Huron was an appearance by Tom Morello, who sang the marching song about unions in Madison, and a good time was held by <laughs> one and all. When was this taken? Just shortly. Oh, December? When, when did the quarter end? Oh. Yeah, December, late December. Anything else? That's it, okay, thanks. So, there you go. Um, let me ask you for my future use, because that took a lot of time. Was that worthwhile? Yeah. 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 Can I stop? Yeah. No. <laughs> I've said a lot of what I intended to say in the narration, so I'm not sure what more there is to say. Some people want to discuss, well, what happened? We can leave that for questions. Some people want to discuss relation to Occupy. There's no answer when something is still unfolding, but I would point out that um, in uh, the September 17th manifesto of, or de declaration of Zuccotti Park, the first principle that they agreed on was uh, that they, they were calling for a uh, direct and transparent participatory democracy. As a scholar, I'm trying to find out who wrote those words. I'm sure it was, I don't, I, I actually don't know where the words came from. Which uh, just brings me to this, oh, also in Venezuela they have these Bolivarian circles you may well know. And I was down there interviewing people because I noticed when they were student radical activists under the oligarchy of these do-nothing political parties, um, <laughs> that they, they had these activist circles, and they were they, and their goal was a participative democracy. And I couldn't figure out the translation, so I went around asking a lot of uh, Venezuelans if they could remember where the term participatory, participative democracy came from. And you won't be surprised to know that not a one had a, had a clue. They had no idea. The point I'm making is that the, I, the idea doesn't need a Marx. It doesn't need even a Tommy Hayden. <coughs> the idea is built into the dynamics of life. If you're insulted badly enough and you feel you've got to do something and the institutions aren't responding, you will take direct action and you will realize in experience without anybody having to tell you that the broader your base of support, the deeper your base of engagement, the more likely you are to win your struggle. And so I, I, I don't like to think of it as a something in the, in the, in the, on the medicine shelf of, of democracy when democracy is really feeble, but it's sort of like that. I don't think you can go out and preach it and make people go to a lot of meetings and sit in and get arrested unless almost everything else has been exhausted and they have a high level of idealism combined with desperation. That's why I, I do think it has a staying power as a kind of framework that will last. It, it, it's all, th there's a question I would pose to you. How important do you think it is to have a framework? Is it enough to demand the restoration of collective bargaining rights? Is it enough to, to uh, demand that there's equal opportunity at the lunch counter to have coffee? Social movements are usually on fire because of those specific demands, riding a bus. 
But the, the more you get into them, the more I notice people start to seek a framework that will give them some sustainable meaning. What's after this? Uh, will things ever change if one thing changes? And uh, they divide into isms. I won't list them, but they're well known to you. Uh, politically, uh, people divide into factional isms, and religions divide into factional schisms. <laughs> And when the two are combined, it's extremely toxic. <laughs> but you'll notice uh, the people who are into their various isms never really make that the basis for their call to the American people. They have a, a, a private belief in an ism, and it gives them sustaining uh, strength. And they have friends who share the ism before the schism. And they have books and articles that they share among people, and they recruit to their ism. But none of the movements of the 60s were led by an ism. They were all led by, well, feminism, environmentalism, but you know what I mean, not ideological isms or religious uh, isms. And so the only thing I can imagine from my experience that could contain the inevitable healthy, sometimes unhealthy, other times, plenitude of differences among us would be a concept like participatory democracy, in which there's plenty of room for every kind of ism, every kind of faction, every kind of current, every kind of tendency. Uh, and I think there's a reason in the la last uh, decades that we have seen ourselves again and again uh, confronted with movements that demand power for themselves. They get dismissed as identi merely identity movements by those who only think class struggle is the uh, serious issue. I do not, for a minute, dismiss them. I, I, I have a deep interest, for example, in my Irish identity and my ancestors who settled in Sullivan and how they had a little place on the Underground Railroad. Identity matters to me. But I would never think for a moment of trying to organize the American people around being uh, a, a, a principle of Irish Catholic revivalism. <laughs> Put me away. <laughs> I would. Uh, but there's room for that within the framework of participatory democracy, which is about a lot of forms of self-determination by a lot of diverse people. That's why I think it has this quality of resilience. Uh, it not only springs to life when people are suffocated and see no alternative, but as it springs to life, it provides constant space and incentive for people to become more participatory and to demand more things and come alive in a, a, a coalition. I guess Jesse Jackson would call it a Rainbow Coalition, that's another model of the <coughs> biblical tradition. Uh, uh, but I think participatory democracy is a broader model and will we'll, we'll have a future long after uh, everybody in this room is gone because I don't see any other way that our society or world is going to be bettered except by the continuous coming to life of this kind of uh, uh, value system and uh, strategy and form of organization. I will stop there with great gratitude for your coming and take any questions that you may have. Thank you very, very much.